Welcome back. You know, robotic surgery has revolutionized the way surgeons are able to treat their patients, and I have Dr. Michael Lasser here to explain how. He's the medical director of robotic surgery at JFK Medical Center. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. This is a topic that many people still don't fully understand, and a lot of questions, I think, still surround robotic surgery, like, first of all, what is it? That's a huge question I get a lot of in the office, and uh, along with that is, hey, do you even do the surgery anymore? Right. Uh, There's almost an automatic assumption that when you have robotic surgery, a robot is performing the operation. Correct, yeah. Not the case? Not at all. There's no autonomous function to the robot whatsoever. It doesn't do anything. In other words, the robot is not functioning on its own. Not at all. Correct, yeah. So it is a robot that essentially would be stand still and do nothing unless told to do something or instructed to do so by the surgeon. What does it physically look like when you're operating this robot? It's an, it's an impressive robot. It has four arms, one of which controls a camera, and three of which control instruments. When people come in and they ask about what robotic surgery is, I always start with the discussion of what is minimally invasive surgery, or laparoscopy. And laparoscopy is what we've used to convert big surgeries to small surgeries. So we do surgery through small incisions with cameras and instruments. There's proven benefits to that. So patients now get out of the hospital faster, with less blood loss, less complications in certain situations. But there's always some risk that you can't do all surgeries in a laparoscopic or minimally invasive approach. Now we have the robot, which has allowed us to convert certain complex surgeries from an open surgery to a minimally invasive approach. So now we can take these patients who would have had to have a large incision and stay in the hospital for a long time with more pain, convert them to a minimally invasive or laparoscopic approach so we can kind so of provide those benefits. You, so you are controlling the arms, the hands, let's say, of this robot, but those hands are smaller than a doctor's hands? That's correct, yeah. So it actually uses instruments that, if you look at it, they're about as wide as a pinky or so. So the benefits of the robot are that we can manipulate the, the instruments or the tools we use as if we're using our own hands. They have a degree of freedom of seven, which is the exact amount of freedom that you have with your hands. So, so the rotation of the hand, the rotation of the wrist, the exactly robot has the, the same, exact yeah. same movement. That's the revolutionary part of it in that in the past, the laparoscopy I mentioned before, it was really just kind of straight instruments that rotated and pivoted. Now we can use them as if we're using our own hands. But again, it's only the size of our pinky. So the cut in the skin, much, much smaller than if we were using hands. So you think about a doctor's hands, right? And mm -hmm. there, are, there have to be some human... Uh, elements, some human factors that play into a surgery. I'm thinking like the shaking of the hand. Mm -hmm. do, do you have that with the robot? So that's human tremor and no matter, no matter how long a surgeon's been operating or how experienced you are, there's a certain degree of human tremor that's present, but the robot does help to filter that out. So. Any correlation of human tremor to the number of cups of coffee that the doctor has? Oh, I'm certain <laughs> that there is. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, so, so you can be more precise, mm -hmm. right? And once again, the impact on the patient, explain that. So the impact on the patient is similar to converting big open surgery to this minimally invasive approach or surgery with small incisions and instruments. We get patients out of the hospital faster, less pain after surgery, a decreased or lower amount of blood loss during surgery, and overall we call it convalescence or time to get back to normal is shorter so people recover quicker. Those are the benefits that we can provide to our patients. Now we understand what it is. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? What kind of operations are you performing? So I'm a urologist and I do urologic robotic surgery. At JFK we've actually implemented an entire program and we're growing that program, both urologic, colorectal, and soon coming down the road, general surgery as well as a gynecologic robotic surgery. So what kind of conditions are you treating? Right, so as a urologist what I treat a lot of is going to be prostate cancer and kidney cancer and then urinary obstructions. There's a lot of other treatments out there, including, for instance, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, when you know women have some prolapse of the bladder that we can fix in that manner. So the whole breadth of surgical diseases we can approach in many instances. Prostate cancer sure. is interesting because it is one of the only curable or preventable, really, cancers, right? So prostate cancer, uh, a lot of people don't know it, right? There's a lot of controversy out there about screening, what to do, when to do it. An important point that many people aren't aware of is that prostate cancer happens to be uh, one of the most common diagnosed solid, or solid organ cancers in American men and the second leading cause of cancer death in American men, only behind lung cancer. Additionally, once over the age of 75, it's the leading cause of cancer death in American men. Uh, the way to prevent it, there's really no way to, to absolutely prevent it, but more so to identify your risk factors. Identify who's at risk and then determine when that person should be screened for prostate cancer. 
The screening consists of a blood test called PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, and an exam of the prostate. At what age should men get this? That's the controversy, right? So right now, do you want to overdiagnose? Do you want to underdiagnose? The truth is that since we started screening, we've had a near 40% drop in death from prostate cancer. The American Cancer Society, as well as the American Neurologic Association, still recommend screening. It comes down to an individualized discussion with your doctor. You need to sit down with your doctor, have a discussion about your risk stratification. So are you high risk? Who's high risk? And that includes people who are African American and have a, a primary family member with prostate cancer, a father, a brother, et cetera. And then once you determine your risk, determine how often you would like to be screened and when you'd like to start. So all that said, is there a general age at which you should not get past without getting that screen? There is. Generally, it's somewhere in the range of 50 to 55 you should consider being screened. If you're high risk, even earlier. All you men out there, if you're over the age of 50, I hope you heard what Dr. Lasser just said. Get the screening. <laughs> um, so how is the combination of screening and laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, able to improve outcomes? Well, what we've seen is that if you look back before the robot existed, which came into play in urology about 2001, all of the prostate cancer surgery was done open. So a big cut from the belly button down to the pubis or down to the pelvis. Nowadays, you know, since that, the technology of the surgical robot's been adapted, in 2008, 80% or so of the prostate cancer surgeries done in the U.S. were done robotically, and that number's risen. So nowadays, we've taken a surgical disease that in young people especially, is one of the better options, but you can, there are other options for treating prostate cancer. That being said, if you're going to be getting surgery, we now have an ability to provide them with a lesser invasive way to treat it. Also, we didn't get into it, but with the robot, we have a three-dimensional view during the surgery. We also have a 10 times magnification, so we do have a more precise way of accomplishing these surgeries, which can translate into better outcomes. So robots are not replacing doctors, but they are helping doctors to do a much better job for their patients, improving outcomes, making things better for everyone. Dr. Michael Lasser, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.